Hi, I'm your host, Anand J. Sukadia, and this is the Limitless One Podcast. Join me on this journey as I interview the most inspirational souls who are tapping into their limitless blueprint on a mental, physical, and spiritual level to thrive in uncertain times. If you feel you are so much more than just this body, just this life, and want to tap into your limitless potential, you're in the right place. Here we go, starseeds. Have you ever tried to check your own identity or ego? How about utterly demolishing it with the full force of Shiva energy? Our guest today has been on a journey of relinquishing his ego in exchange for freedom and bliss. Only by finding the true bliss in every moment, we can overcome the limited emotional states of the mind and expand our heart and soul awareness to limitless levels. Marnix Destichter left a highly successful 10-year engineering career because he felt the need to let go of the constant feeling of unrest that resulted in the need to constantly do something. A period of over a year ensued in which Marnix spent sitting on park benches and walking around until this need fell away and he could simply be comfortable with just being. Although this year showed many glimpses and resulted in the breaking down of the concept of self, seeking remained. After this period, Marnix went back into the world and has now worked as a wedding photographer ever since, where he has won top 10 wedding photographers in the world awards in his first year and the prestigious International Wedding Photographer of the Year Award in his second year. Marnix lives in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and shares non-duality teachings and gives kundalini energy and breathwork sessions. He loves dancing, photography, spending time in nature, sharing insights on the subject of duality. Welcome to the podcast, Marnix. How are you, brother? I am good. Thanks for having me. Oh my goodness. It's my pleasure. Uh, we had the beautiful experience of being in Egypt together for, for 11 days and I got to learn so much about you and and you gave a, a couple of talks on pranic living and living from a non-dualistic perspective and you were a Kundalini activator for us. And yeah, you just had so many amazing energy that you shared with, uh, with the group. And it was one of the highlights of the trip getting to know you. And uh, I really wanted to get deeper and, and finding out more about you and your story. So yeah, this is uh this is a real blessing for, for me to have you on. Thanks so much. No, I really appreciate it. And uh, it was a beautiful trip. Great to meet so much, uh, so many, uh, uh, wonderful people and uh yeah it's uh it's awesome to uh to have gotten to know you it was it now four weeks ago that we uh, uh three yeah, weeks I think. I think yeah right so it was like i got back on march 7th and it's today's the uh the third right so yeah we're looking about like a little over three yeah. weeks mid three and a half weeks yeah so how you been since yeah. the since the trip yeah really good yeah egypt is a magical place it's interesting i, I never had like a, a real connection with egypt apart from the fact that i fought the the pyramids were very interesting and I'd probably visit it one day, but then suddenly everything uh, came into a sort of acceleration. I was like, okay, apparently that's where I'm going. And that's how things kind of go in my life. Like suddenly something's on my path and it's like, okay, apparently that's what we're doing. Uh, and I'm really happy. Uh, yeah. That I went, it was such a the, the, the energy there, the different locations. We had such an amazing group. It was, uh, it all came together uh, quite beautifully. Yeah. And it, just the the magical souls that ended up there. It's kind of like, uh, you know, this soul family, when we start, when we were born, we were disconnected. And then all of a sudden we we come to this beautiful moment in in, the, in humanity. It's such an important time. And for us to be able to, all of us had such a unique story about how we ended up on this trip and got to connect. So what was your, like, what was your, the synchronicities that happened for you to actually make the decision to go to Egypt? Yeah. Yeah. Um... It was, I think, a year and a half ago, someone recommended me the book, um, The Emerald Tablet of Toth the Atlantean. And uh, in that book, which is a pretty weird book, uh, it uh, talked about lying in the king's chamber in the sarcophagus uh, in complete darkness after long periods of not eating. And I like ticked all the boxes like, okay, that's the things I do for fun. So <laughs> I would love to go there, but how on earth do you get into the great pyramids lie in the sarcophagus like right yeah that sounds impossible 
And then the next day I see on YouTube a recommendation of this podcast where uh, Robert Edward Grant is on. And he talks about, yeah, yeah, I'm go- I have the key for the, the Great Pyramids and I lie in the sarcophagus in the King's Chamber. Oh, and I also do trips over there. It's like, okay, well, I guess I'll be signing up then. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Very, very similar to to my experience. Yeah, the the whole being in a private tour overnight in the pyramids and just I had the opposite. I was like drawn to Egypt ever since I was a young kid. So like watching all all these different movies like Indiana Jones and like ancient history and going on expeditions, unlocking the secrets of humanity. And then even little shows like DuckTales. I don't know if you remember that cartoon. Yeah, 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 that like he Scrooge McDuck brought his little kid, his nephews to the pyramids. And like it was just it was always in my mind and I always had dreams about it. And this particular year I was having so many dreams and the opportunity came to go on this trip. And the first thing I did was uh, I, I sent in my application. I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And then I was like, okay, maybe this is not the right time. I was trying to make up all these mind stories, right. Which really fucks us in the end. And then I said, no. And then the opportunity came again because I kept having dreams. And then my friend Brandt, who you met, he told me about it. I'm like, okay, this is all right. I'm still having dreams. This, This is a sign. I need to go. I signed up and it was, so perfect. And so many things have unlocked since then, not just the people that I met, but also business opportunities and all this kind of stuff. So wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, yeah, just so, so blessed to be able to have this experience. And I know that now going forward, like anytime my intuition tells me something, I got to say, yes, just got to go for it because you only regret the things you don't do, not the things that you actually do do. Definitely. Yeah. Nice. Beautiful. Yeah. So Marnix, can you tell us a little bit about your background? You have such a beautiful story and maybe I don't mind, we could go into it pretty deep if you like to, um, and, uh, kind of like explain what, how you had this transition in your life. Yeah, sure. Um, so I have a engineering background. I'm actually quite the geek. I, uh, studied engineering, uh, school, uh, industrial design engineering. And for many years I worked as an engineer, mostly in China, optimizing, uh, products and factories for uh, sending uh, medical equipment to uh, the West. Um, and uh, But during my entire, well, youth study, I always had an affini- uh, affinity with meditation and Kung Fu and these kind of things. Uh, so over time, that grew stronger and stronger. And it was after working 10 years as a freelance uh, engineer that uh, kind of life changed dramatically. Uh, when I tagged off all the boxes that life tells you or society tells you, okay, that's that's what you need when in order to be happy. You know, beautiful girlfriends, beautiful house, a lot of money, traveling, healthy. Uh, so you're supposed to be happy. And then I remember this distinct morning when I was walking past the mirror and then I realized, okay, but why do you look pissed off then if you've tagged off all the boxes? Um, yeah. And that was the beginning of everything starting to crumble. Uh, ended up my relationship, uh, moved out of the house, quit my job. A good friend of mine uh, recommended you, you should, uh, because he knew I was into meditation, but I only did like basic meditation. He said, you should do a, a 10 day Vipassana retreat. So 10 days of silence, uh, not looking at other people, 10 days per 10 hours per day of meditation, just observing the, 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 the system and everything and the, and the mind. I thought, okay, that's quite extreme, but uh, why not? Let's try this. And uh, it was quite bizarre because for four days straight, I heard my own voice saying, dude, you should go home and meditate for two hours and work for 10 hours. At least then you'll get something done. (laughs) Uh, So that was quite dysfunctional, but there was this this split in my psyche that could like observe the thoughts completely. And it's like, okay, this is bizarre. And it's, it's not even just my thoughts, but the thought of, the entire society because when you meet other people it's like uh how, how are you doing like you're supposed to say like you're busy <laughs> as if that's like a, a barometer for how much you're worth uh instead of like if you say like not, not much i'm just chilling now people are like 
dude, you're, you're not helping. You're supposed to be doing stuff and making the world better. <laughs> um, so it was, it was clear that if I would follow this voice inside my head for the rest of my life, I'd be a slave to it. Um, so in this Vipassana retreat, the basic is that you just sit and you observe any sensation in your system, any thought that comes up. Um, and I decided, well, after those 10 days, uh, I'm not going to take any engineering job for the next few weeks. I'll just sit on the couch, literally. And I have my phone just out of hand's reach. And whenever I <clears throat> feel the need to grab from my phone, um, I'd stop, say, okay, why? What? What is it? Why can't I simply be? Why do I have to do stuff all the time? And what is this desire for this dopamine hit to cover up something that I don't want to feel? Um, and it was quite intense, but at the same time, I really loved it. And I live next to the park here in the city center uh, of Rotterdam, where I live. And I thought, look, well, after those two weeks, why not extend this and just sit in a park uh, benches or maybe walk around a bit or around the city? And those two weeks turned into two months and those two months turned into well over a year where I simply sat and walked um, to, be, to become comfortable with simply being and not having to do stuff all the time. So that was the biggest change and that year led to a lot of uh big shifts crazy um experiences um but what it left me with was a, a trust in life that life knows and the entire concept of who i am started to crumble more and more um so that's a <laughs> the short version of uh, of what happened yeah. Beautiful. And um, let me ask you a question. In Rotterdam, it gets pretty cold. So you were there like even in the wintertime all day long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I didn't sleep outside. I actually. I slept outside, but, uh, yeah. No, I spent like six, eight, sometimes 14 hours just outside walking, 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 being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and during this time, obviously, you know, like especially when you're first new to doing an experience like this. Was there ever times you were like, okay, no, I need to like go back and this is like, come on, Marks, come on, get back to the real world and and start working again. What what are you doing here? Like, were those thoughts coming up, or did you kind of just make yeah, the dedication? Yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> uh, and of course, also because I didn't have any any income, mm -hmm. so it would be like, oh, can I pay rent this month? And always something last minute, someone would drop by. It's like, oh, could you? Uh, take a picture of me or could you do this, like, help me uh, one day with engineering uh, issues or I would get like um, um, from a, from a former uh, employee, they would, they have uh, uh, my pension plan. And I said, okay, well, you haven't worked in so many years. Do you want to buy off your pension plan? And you get us some uh, uh, lump sum. So that would like always last minute, something would come to me. And I'd be able to to make ends meet and make ends meet. So it resulted in such a trust in life. And whenever that voice came up, it was like, and it was funny because I was so happy, just simply being. I didn't need anything else. Um, and still nowadays, you can you can put me anywhere. Like, doesn't matter how busy it is. It just to have that constant need, that constant unease fall away is like the biggest blessing. Um, and I, I truly wish it for anyone. And then that's, yeah, so beautiful. Now, when you started reflecting back on your life previously, who was Marnix as a, as a person Back then, I know you still had, you know, you had a love for meditation and, you know, you had all these, uh, these intuitions to seek more, but who is he as a person versus who you are now? Yeah. So I, I used to be quite a nervous kid as a young child, um, uh, a lot of stress, tension, um, 
but I was always aware that that was something that was in the way of being happy. So from a young age, I'd become aware of like, oh, there's tension in my system. I remember maybe I was like eight or nine. That was the first time I, I really couldn't sleep at night. And then I started observing my body and I realized like, I'm just tense all over. And the moment I realized that I could let go and I, I fell asleep immediately. Um, I had a lot of stress during uh, a family situation of parents not getting along. Uh, and I would have, for many years straight, I would have nosebleeds, which lasted sometimes up to two hours and would just keep on going. And it was, a, a, a I only noticed this later on, but this was a way of the system to relieve uh, the stress that was trapped in the body. Um, and it was interesting. I, I literally had one talk with, uh, psychologists. And after that one talk, I never had a nosebleed anymore because it was clear like, oh, okay. It's suppressing the, the tension that is in the household and trying to contain it, but it has to come out. So I have to let it go, let it go, let it be not resist, not hold on. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it was very clear that how much the, the mind and the body is connected. Yeah. And all, everyone has a different way of like, kind of like we're, we're all tea kettles, right? And we have to, we have to release somehow, right? So some people yeah. go to alcohol, some people go to drugs, some people do meditation, yoga, Kundalini activation. There's so many different variables, but like once we start transmuting, like some, some things that are, you know, not necessarily great for us health wise, and then transmute it into something that's positive for us. That's when like that activation starts happening inside the body. And then the awareness starts flowing in because yeah, once you get that awareness, and your problems go away that's really like that's everything in life when we could get, get to that place of oh my goodness aha moments you know and it's just like you get to that next level in life and then you rarely ever have to repeat the the same you know situation or experience once we kind of unlock that that secret mm. right yeah yeah <laughs> no and, and it's it's such uh, a relief, like uh, the term enlightenment. Well, I just love the part light in it. Life is just so much lighter as if you've put down a really heavy backpack. And uh, there's just, um, you know, even, even after that year in the park, there was still a seeking behavior, trying to find out like what still needed to be done in order for uh, liberation to occur. And it, it took like five, six years until the last seeking energy seemed to have dropped. Um, and as a result, there's this absence of resistance to whatever arises. So I can find myself being irritated or I can find myself being happy, but it's just, I love both in the Tao Te Ching and in the Bible, it's, it's they talk about to become like a newborn child, right? Uh, so that, uh, Young children don't have this concept of how life should be. They're just, they find themselves happy. They find themselves sad. That's how it flows. Uh, and it's similar to that, that uh, this resistance, which is based on a concept we have of ourselves. So when you live with a concept of yourself, then you're limited and life never uh, matches up to this concept you have of yourself. So you're you're fighting it all the time because you need to uphold this idea you have of yourself. So you come up with excuses why life isn't matching up to this idea you have of yourself. And it's such a, a burden. You're fighting the entire time. Why can't you simply be? Why do you have to be this or that? Being simply without this label and without the the fighting uh of the discrepancy that's going on yeah many of us have the the tendency to build our own prison of the mind right where we're brick by brick with every single interaction we have oh this person looks like this every time someone looks like that they're gonna be the same way right so it's like yeah. creating this little box around yourself and not really being fully present in the in the moment so obviously i, I love talking about the what what our guests think about what is limitless? What is it to live limitless? So for you, what does living a limitless life mean? 
by definition, if you take yourself to be this or that, and to put it more concrete, if you take yourself to be this body or these thoughts or these emotions or these sensations or whatever, or your, your title, oh, I'm, I'm a photographer, I'm an engineer, I'm a Kundalini activation practitioner, you know, all these labels, they can be okay for the story, but if you take yourself to be that, by definition, you're limited, limiting yourself. If you say I'm A and not B, then that what you truly are is in conflict because everyone knows there's this deep seated clarity in us that we are limitless. And whenever you say I'm this or that, you are fighting that. And uh, to be truly limitless, you have to let go of the concept of yourself, of being this person that's trying to make ends meet and has to fight and has to uphold his or her personality. Like, oh, I'm this. Yeah, it's, it's you... so... <laughs> Sorry, good. No, no, no. No, it's crazy. I've been thinking about this so much lately is like the more, yeah, the more you try to build your life in, in the direction of your, your dreams or whatever, you create the, you know, you build your ego, you build your identity, you build the labels. And then, but in the, in the reality that we live in this 3d reality, unless we go and meditate in a cave somewhere in, in Tibet, like, how do you, how do you navigate and dance through the waters of life? when we have there's a certain element of say currency we need to have in order to in order to feel limitless and be able to have limitless experiences how do we navigate that without the identity without the ego but still also be able to kind of have those experiences that we want to without living in this in this matrix per se yeah so uh it was actually in Egypt when i woke up in the middle of the night and had to write down this this poem about how when we have this concept of what we want, even what we want is a limitation because our wants and desires often come from a, uh, a pain in the past that we try to overcome. So I want to be rich because I felt poor. I want to be strong because I was weak and bullied as a small child. So it's here. So the poem is called Why Limit Yourself? And this is it. Why limit yourself to merely that what you could want for when so much more is there for you to be received? Trust, let go, and dive fully into the unfathomable depths of your own unconditionality. So what I try to say, express there is that whenever the, the mind comes up with an idea, it's like, oh, I'd like to achieve that. There's like laughter inside. It's like, almost saying, why pollute the road with your pity little ideas of what you think you should need in order to be happy? When, when you let go, God or divine life can give you something far beyond your imagination. To, to be empty of this story of self results in the most fluent and, and most beautiful expression of life. And, uh, I don't even want to pollute it with my own dreams and desires. Yeah. Our, our own thinking is, is really what limits us. So like, yeah, when, you know, like Dr. Joe Dispenza, he, he'll talk about going into the quantum field where there's nothingness, where everything is potential. Right. And then during one of the talks you gave, you talked about the Shiva and Shakti energy and how there's only creation in the absence of creation. Can you tell us a little bit of, of, about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think at a young age, I was already lying in a, in a, in a garden at night and looking up to the stars. And I realized like, oh, there's, there's only two things. There's energy and absence of energy. And it was only later on that I realized like, oh, okay, well, that absence of energy, that's the, the Shiva aspect, that's complete emptiness, the, the Shiva the destroyer. So this complete emptiness allows for absolute potential. And that's the Shakti. Shakti can birth any form that she likes. 
but in order for that form to arise, it needs a substratum, so to so to speak, a basis, the shiva, which on which it can be built. And I think the the path I followed, and everyone has their own path. I mean, think I think. Uh, as as many souls as there are, there there the similar amount of paths to liberation. But for me, maybe because I'm a very mind dominated person uh, with an engineering background, for me, Yana Yoga was very resonated a lot, like self inquiry. And there's like a, a, a two part to it. So first, you disidentify from the level of form by realizing, okay, asking questions like, who am I? Or uh, the neti neti process, like, uh, I'm not my body, uh, I'm not my thoughts, I'm not my emotions. So you sweep the floor until that what you are remains. And you, you don't even give it a name or a concept because then it would be something again that you can hold on to. And when that is empty, when you are established at least to a certain degree there, then you can dive in again after this uh, Vedantic part, you go into the tantric part. So you are able to embrace life completely, to dive into the richness of this moment without the fear of losing yourself. Because it's, it's of course, normal that we are so entrenched in, in the world of form and we think only in form that first we get out and see, oh, oh, well, I'm this that knows, that sees everything. I'm this in which everything occurs. But there's still this split a bit, like uh, a little bit of, I can't be touched. You know, (laughs) I'm the observer, which is a normal thing because the world of form has hurt us so much. So this is like a safe haven. But it becomes a bit cold, a bit distant. And some people feel the need to stay there, and I can't imagine why. But for me, there was the need to dive into life again fully and embrace every moment. And and after that year of sitting in the park, I found myself like, hey, I, I want to dive in life completely and that's when i decided to go into wedding photography i had been shooting one wedding per year because friends would ask me um and i almost see like that was like a reintegration process into the 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 real life yeah yeah it's it's really incredible you know i have this experience um in an ayahuasca experience uh, where I realized that just the temporary nature of everything, it's like the oceans, they recede and then they come back in the waves, right? They're constantly, it's going to be an eternal process. You know, there's going to be creation and destruction. So in the the macro sense of the universe and then the sun is going to uh, someday get destroyed. The, the earth as well will not be more, but it's also in our lives. And, and to be able to make the decision every day when I go to bed, I got the the intuition that I need to be able to burn everything to an ash. Everything that I have is going to someday not be there, right? Whether it's my body, whether it's my relationships, whether it's my beautiful little dog, everything, right? So coming to the understanding of, yeah, there's going to be that time of Shiva where nothing is there. And then the potential, the ash actually uh, is the seed for the next the next process of creation. And when I can do that on every single day basis of like going to bed, knowing that, okay, whatever happened today is over, whatever thoughts I had about anyone, let's leave that in the past. And then now let's create, because the, the moment we start bringing in those thoughts from yesterday into today, we're just, again, building that prison of our mind when we're we're just looking at things from the same box. And then, yeah, our perspective just keeps getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And we could continue to do this over and over and over, or we can make the decision to look at life through a child's eyes, like you you mentioned earlier. And um, yeah, well, you know, the other thing I'll say is um, when you come out of that place of, you know, like the observer, I was trying to do that a lot during COVID and understanding like, hey, there's so much chaos going on step outside for a second. I was getting so deep into these meditations that, you know, there was a lot of things happening in my life where people around me, they were passing. I, there was so many people that that passed away during these three years for whatever reason. 
And like, I was finding myself not feeling the emotion that I normally would. And it was like worrisome to me that am I disconnecting so much from being in this, in this life versus trying to be in, you know, in a higher state of consciousness. And then you realize, yeah, that is also a flow of like getting to that place of that quantum field where everything is potential and then diving back into this life and really appreciating this gratitude for, for this beautiful thing that we, that we have it's just an experience, so why not play full out and and fully embrace each moment, every every situation? Yeah, beautiful. Now I, I recognize it uh, a lot. I've also had the last years people close to me fall away, and I was a bit shocked that I wasn't as affected as I thought I should be. Um, but it, it became clear that we also have this idea in our society that, yeah, so that love is shown through strong emotions like grief. I had a friend once who uh, her mom passed away and she was holding on to this grief for many years and we dove into it. It's like, what do you, if you dive into the feeling, what is it you feel you want to achieve with this grief? And her grief was linked to her way of showing love to her mom and respect to her mom, which is understandable but at the same time not functional actually dysfunctional because it was preventing her from living her life and if her mom would see her in that state she would probably slap her out of it like you are here on earth enjoy it to the max and stop with this silly game of thinking you should be sad for my absence because it's it's preventing you from living. Um, so no, it's quite recognizable what you said um, that you felt like a little bit like is there something wrong with me there? I, I've I've had this many times, and then I realized like well, actually the the, the basic pattern that we inherit from our society that's the dysfunctional part. Similarly with with with. Um, Pride and shame. We hold on uh, very much to our identities of, oh, I did something wrong in the past and now I feel ashamed. Or I did something right and now I feel good about myself. Beyond high or low self-esteem is no self-esteem. And of course, it's nicer to have high self-esteem or than, than low self-esteem, but with no self-esteem, there's no story of self and you just flow with whatever arises. And it's, again, that weight of the story of self drops. And I find myself being sometimes surprised of how happy I am, regardless of life's circumstances. Um, yeah, and so that's... That's something I try to communicate and help people with to find that in themselves because really what you are and what Satchitananda, knowing being bliss, it's it's your true nature. And um, you don't need any circumstance to be able to touch that. Yeah. We've been we have to realize that the happiness, that joy, that inner bliss, that Ananda is within us. And it took me a really long time. My name is Ananda, actually. It means eternal bliss. And trying to go through life, trying to seek out happiness and pleasure everywhere else, but but inside myself, and then developing that relationship with myself and looking myself in the mirror and telling myself that I love you and thank you and being so grateful for the life that you chose and the hardships and the struggles and the victories and the beauty and the love, all of it, you are the one common denominator in your life. So 
why do you think everything else on the outside was the cause of these beautiful things? You know? So mm-hmm. once you get into that place of, oh my goodness, you are that creator, then why cre- why would you create any type of guilt or any type of sadness or any of that stuff inside the mind rather than focus on what you truly are when you strip away everything else and that's just light and and love. And I, I love the fact that, you know, you dedicated so many years of of your life to kind of like peeling off the layers of the onion because it's not easy. And to have the time and the ability to do that, it takes a lot of dedication and a lot of full trust into into the universe and the plan for you. And, um, you know, like now I, I want to kind of segue into you re entering into the, the, the reality of this 3d world and, mm. you know, getting into photography because that's a really beautiful story. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, I already was shooting weddings for 10 years. Uh, during my graduation, a good friend of mine said, oh, I love the, the pictures you make. Could you shoot pictures of my wedding? I was like, sure, let's try. Uh, and, um, I loved it so much. I even loved it more than my entire studies, but it's like, no, okay. I've been trained as an engineer and I want to spend time in China. So that's what I did. But every year someone would call me up. It's like, Oh, do you want to shoot my wedding? And every time I did, I was like, Oh, I love this so much because industrial design engineering, I loved it because it's, it's creative and technical at the same time. But wedding photography is creative, technical and the connection with humans and, and, had a beautiful day, you know, celebrating love. Um, so it was like the perfect mix. And uh, so after that year sitting in a, in a park, I decided, well, okay, let's try this. And uh, it, it, it literally exploded. I feel that it's so linked to, I mean, it was for 10 years, it was here, you know, like wedding photography. Hello, you love it. You're good at it. Come on. Um. But when I uh, had that year, so much trust came and I decided, okay, well, let's try this for one year. And uh, it would be nice to, to have like 12 weddings for the next year. I think it was in October or November. It's like, okay, for next year, 12 weddings. And the thought came to mind of uh, a marketing idea. And it worked so well that within five weeks time, I had booked 28 weddings. And I was fully booked for the entire year. And um, a colleague recommended I participate in uh, awards uh, for wedding photographers. And uh, it was so bizarre. I mean, there's different awards, so you have to kind of find which one is is linked to your style. Uh, But in in the first year, I ended up in the top 10 of the world. And... um, and a few years later, uh, I, I, with one award, I ended up at the winning international wedding photographer of the year. And it's so weird because again, coming back to what you said, like someone passing away and you didn't feel that what you thought you should feel. Similarly, I, I couldn't feel the pride that you think you should have and I had colleagues like okay so we've been doing this for 20 years and suddenly Marnix comes along out of nowhere and you know I'd, I'd win prizes and the people would call me up or send messages like oh my god you should really celebrate this you know and I was like there there's an, a true appreciation of the beautiful work but even back then the 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 part of the ego that remained it felt like it couldn't take uh, any credit for it because it was because of the absence of Marnix, the photographer, that the real beautiful pictures came. Uh, and whenever Marnix, the photographer, would come back, it would be like, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And what what do you think? The So describe the, you said you had the absence of Marnix. So like when you were taking photos, was it just mostly you were in the flow and you were in thinking, there was no mind there. It was just being in that in that moment. Yeah, yeah. So, so mind isn't a problem. I, I. Uh, so, but yeah. So, it, there's a lot of flow. A lot of people talk, of course, about mindfulness and things like this. And mindfulness is like a, a first step to become aware that there's something behind the thoughts. To realize, like, okay, I can also be without thoughts. Uh, so, and I'm not dead. So, thoughts aren't. Uh, and crucial element to me. So it can come and go and I'm still there. 
and to be more fully into the moment and actually not get lost in the story. Uh, once you are established in this emptiness, in the Shiva aspect, then Shakti, which is also mind because it's a form, it's something that can be, uh, that has like a, well, it, it's not a physical form, but you can distinguish it. So it's clear like a, a thought, like a car, thought of a car, that's a form. So once you're established enough in the Shiva aspect, then the Shakti aspect can't um, take you any, away anymore. You can't lose yourself in it anymore. So thoughts aren't a problem. During photography, thoughts arise. Um, but they're not seen as anything different than a physical object, so to say, so to say, that arises. Um, and and that is actually the the main thing that really dropped in that year. The concept of self started to break down, where I would have moments where we all notice when you are in love this contraction you have here in the chest or in, in the body or the throat or the head that says, I'm here and this is the outside world, it kind of dissolves, right? You and the other, they blend. And similarly with a beautiful sunset or listening to a beautiful symphony, there's this relaxation of this tension. And I would have and have had many experiences ever since where sometimes for a few seconds or sometimes long periods, like a half hour or 45 minutes, that entire contraction, it wouldn't just get weaker. It just was gone entirely. And in those instances, it's absolutely clear that there's no time, that there's no space, and that even the concept of I am makes no sense whatsoever. But then it would come back again. And what it did was it started to break down really dramatically this concept of who I thought I was. But yes, there was this clinginess holding on to those moments where that absence of contraction was there. It's like, oh, I need to go back there. And it was only like five, six years after sitting in a, in a park that I was talking to a good friend of mine who, unlike for me, it was a very gradual process. Her first moment of her first glimpse of awakening um, to complete liberation went very fast in one year. So her entire life got totally turned upside down. Um, so for me, it was very slowly, uh, very gradually. And she asked me the question like, Monique, do you still feel a, a seeking energy? And I tried to look into it and I, I, I said, no, I, I don't seem, seem to find it. But it was actually a few days later that I did a Kundalini activation training uh, to become a facilitator and fully diving into the, the Kundalini energy. I noticed something in my chest kind of released. And um, that night I went to bed and before I fell asleep, I was thinking about what she asked me. It's like, do you still feel that seeking energy? And then I realized like, huh, I still hold on a bit more to those moments where the contraction isn't there to the moments when the contraction is there. And there's still this kind of feeling of being here. I was like, I was actually a bit surprised, like, oh, yeah, so there is still the seeking energy. And then I fell asleep, and at 4 o'clock at night, I woke up, and for 45 minutes straight, I was laughing hysterically because I realized that whether the contraction is there or not, everything is made out of the same element, namely knowing I, even the concept of I, it's only based on knowing. And I, I, I usually, uh, I like this, this very simple way of describing it. If you say, I hear the bird. Now we can dive into the I and we could say, okay, we, we, we walked a Vedantic path uh, and uh, am I my thoughts? No, my thoughts come and go. Am I my feelings? No. 
my body also changes maybe more slowly, but no, that's not me. So yet there is something that knows it, that knows the situation that, that hears the bird. So there's, I could change the word I to the knower, I the knower, and then I hear the birds. Oh, well, do I really know that there, if there's a bird? Well, I could have mistaken it for something else. There might be like a, a sound that resembles a bird. I might be, I've been taking some hallucinogenic uh, drug and I think there's a bird, but there's no bird. <laughs> I might be in a dream. I, I wake up in the morning and then I was like, a few minutes ago, I was absolutely convinced there was a bird, but there wasn't a bird. It was just all happening in my mind. So I can't really say that there's a bird. The only thing I could say, if I want to break it down and distill it to the one main element is like, well, it's known. Something is known. So that I hear the bird becomes I the knower, hear the known. And then we go to the verb, that which connects the subject and the object. And then you could say, well, do I really know that I heard it? Well, similarly in a dream, if I just had a dream and I was walking in a park and I heard the bird and then I wake up and it's like, was there an actual sound going into the ear being processed? No. So even the verb hearing, if you distill it down, it's like, there's knowing. So then I hear the bird comes, the knower knows the known. So all layers of life only consist out of one thing, knowing, which is consciousness. Uh, even the I, which knows, it's only consciousness. And it was absolutely clear that whether it's a contraction or not, it makes no sense. All there is, is this. And that's, that's what, in those moments when the contraction fell away, it was always very clear. It's like, only thing I could say is, there's only this. I couldn't find myself. There's just simply this, this what, what, what arises, one dance of being, one beautiful expression of life unfolding. And then when you take that into life, then wedding photography is, is just one beautiful happening without the <clears throat> struggle of the separate self trying to, you know, deal with its pains and its limitations. Yeah, it's so, so beautiful the way that you describe all this and how you break everything down. I, it's got to be the engineer's mind because the engineers <laughs> that I know that are living in their passion and living in their purpose, they're so fulfilled and so happy and they're such uh, incredible communicators. So I know a lot of engineers and some of them are, you know, they, they're they very like left brain oriented. It's really hard for them to kind of describe things, even though they're very analytical. But the way that you kind of transmit your communication, it's like you're you're speaking on several levels to, to people. You're speaking in the words, you're speaking in your emotion, but you're also transmitting certain, you know, higher levels of consciousness. And that's what I noticed when I was I was hearing you you talk. You did that talk on the cruise and even during your Kundalini activation. So, yeah, like it's a. Uh, I think that the engineering background actually serves you so well in, in this path that you're on right now and helping so many people. Yeah. Thanks. No, it's, um, for many years, the, the, the center of gravity was up in the, in the head. And once it drops down into the heart, then the heads, the thoughts are a beautiful tool, uh, to express what comes through the heart. Um, and for many decades, I was just lost in the head. <laughs> like I think many people are, and it's like a, it's like a muscle. Um, can you imagine like you have to do push-ups all day because your muscle is like so strong and so in control of you. You have to do push-ups all day. Like you, during dinner, you have to do push-ups. Like, <laughs> no. I'm eating now. I don't have to do push-ups, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's 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 similar to that. There's this the the mind has become so dominant, and and we've identified with it. So that's coming back to this limitless thing. When you identify with anything, by definition, you're ruling out a lot. And once it becomes clear that you 
don't have a life, but you are life, then there's no distinction between whatever arises and that's what you used to hold on to a story of self. Um, and you can be truly limitless, would be the expression of whatever the divine wants to express through this seeming character that you seem to play, but you really aren't. Because I love this, this analogy of, of Rupert Spira, who I listened to a few times and visited a few times during my years of searching. And he's like, well, when you have this dream and you walk, he said, uh, like you walk on the streets of Paris with your friend and you see the Seine, uh, the, the river, and you see the Notre Dame and, and then you wake up in the morning and you say like, oh no, it happened in my head. But there was this beautiful ability of your mind, you could say, to separate yourself out. Like, no, no, I was me and my friend was there and that was the river, the Seine and the Notre Dame. Who says this isn't the same? I, I have not been able to find any evidence that this real world isn't the same. And I, I do this real world thing because I have so many times in the morning I wake up and then I start laughing hysterically because a few minutes ago I was absolutely convinced that the dream I was in, that was reality. And it's like, no, no, it was just a dream. And then it's like, but I'm as convinced now that this is reality. It's all the same elements, knowing consciousness, a beautiful play, a divine comedy. And uh, once you start to embrace life in such a way, it's, it's a big play, it becomes a big play. Yeah. And the more you kind of understand and know, then the, the circle of what you don't know becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And then my feeling is because I haven't obviously reached to a point where I know everything and I don't think I ever will. But once you get to that place, then you realize everything is so simple. And it's just really, it's just being present, being loved, being light. And then once you get to that place, then you can start creating again. And then the whole cycle starts over again. It's like we, we, we try to expand, expand, expand in our knowledge and our, in our truth and our consciousness, <clears throat> even for, for people who are highly dedicated to this, this practice. And, you know, what is the, the ultimate goal? Really the, the understanding for me is like, we are supposed to embrace this, this, uh, what we want to achieve in every moment and be it and then we realize we've been it all along. It's like not, it's not something that's separate from, from us. And it's not a destination out there. It's a destination in here. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So Marnix, you mentioned Kundalini activation for those that haven't heard about Kundalini activation. Can you tell us a little bit about it and what it actually, what it does for, for people who practice it? Yeah. So, so Kundalini is uh, often described as a, a dormant serpent energy lying at the base of your spine and people it's dormant because it's not activated in most people and the only moments they recognize this energy is when they're aroused and you notice well when you're aroused that there's a surge of energy uh, but it can also rise to other places in your system other chakras uh, and it will give expression to uh all sorts of things creativity love uh wisdom uh health so this is a it's it's seen as a feminine energy that uh is dormant but can rise and it's like the serpent rising along the spinal column and even in the west we know this it's interesting to see that so many cultures talk about a serpent and an energy rising up um, and even in the West, we have like on an ambulance or, or a pharmacy, you have like the, the staff and then you have two. The caduceus. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this, this knowledge that there is a, a link between this energy and, um, yeah, you could say a, a vitality. Now, interestingly, in these sessions, I do a complete passive form of kundalini back in the days when i was studying and doing uh martial arts i got into uh qigong negong uh, these kind of uh, practices and i did a lot of stuff 
and I was actually quite good at focusing on it and, and making it happen. But whenever I would lose my attention a bit and be drift off, it would create quite nasty effects in my system. I would like almost throw up. And then I realized like, oh, I shouldn't play with these energies. Uh, the system knows, let's not toil with this. So actually also during the entire process of searching for enlightenment, I, I, I strayed away from <clears throat> anything that's any object. So bhakti yoga, devotional to a guru, I decided now that's not my path. I don't want to link it to a certain person or a certain deity. Um, Tantra, uh, beautiful experiences, but I don't want to lose myself in that. Kundalini also, I decided, like I've seen a lot of people that try to, similarly like I did with Qigong and Egong, they, they force the Kundalini up and you can go really crazy if you do that stuff because the system isn't ready and there's this minds dominated ideas like, oh, I know what's best. Well, you don't. <laughs> the mind, uh, see, your system knows it has been beating your heart your entire life. There's literally millions of chemical processes going on in all your cells at this instant. If you take yourself to be your mind and your mind thinks, oh, I, I know best. <laughs> if you have to take that, oh, that entire task over for a split second, you'd probably be dead right now. <laughs> so I don't want to unlike with Kundalini yoga, with a lot of breath work and, and forcing up the, the, the energy up the spine. And it's like, oh, I have to open up this chakra now. No, you don't, you don't. The system has its own pace, its own rhythm. And the only thing that's needed is a trust, a trust that she knows what's best. So in these sessions, um, people lie down. There's music to calm the mind down and let go of the story of like, oh, am I making this up or am I actually feeling this? And it also helps to set a certain a certain vibe, a certain energy. And as a facilitator, I notice that my crown chakra opens up and my heart opens up and it starts to flow. But it's important to see that it's not that I'm sending anything and that you're receiving anything and you don't go into a trance or anything. You just simply lie down. Some people start to see a lot of things. Some people start to smell things, hear things, think about things in the past. Some people start to move. Maybe it's just a small slight shoulder movement. Some people really go into all sorts of yoga poses. The first time I saw it, I thought it was fake. <laughs> I, I, I saw a practitioner. And so most practitioners, they do a lot of hand movements, which isn't needed, but if the, practitioner believes it's needed, then it helps to get him or her into the flow state. I rarely do it. Sometimes I feel the need to put my hand somewhere on a person's body. But apart from that, I, I do very little. Actually, the less I do, the better. And I, I love this, this um, poem from Hafiz, Sufi poet, who said, I am a hole in a flute through which the breath of Christ flows, listen to this music. So he's just a complete opening through which his poetry and his wisdom flows. Similarly, in a session like that, uh, and this can be done in face-to-face, -face, in person, or even online, there's just an opening up and people, wherever they are, start, start moving and shaking and it's realigning the system the system knows how to realign itself and let go of all the tension in the body. And it's beautiful to see what happens. I've had people lose their complete fear of flying after a few sessions. I've had people, uh, you know, a lot of energy middle of the night waking up as like, Oh, <laughs> I've done sleeping. I'm, I, I can work all day. Uh, 
people voicing it was interesting at, at our trip there was uh in the, in the session we did uh, the cup session uh, and i use it i use the term cup now because that's kundalini activation process although i didn't train to be a cup facilitator mm-hmm. there's different styles and it's the essence is the same yeah uh in that group there was uh one person that didn't feel anything so the day after we talked like how, how do you feel I was like oh no it was nice he said very relaxing but i didn't feel anything it's okay and we started talking he said uh, yeah we were on the bus and i was sitting next to someone uh and it was really obnoxious he was on his phone and we were talking and it's like listen man either you put the phone away and we talk or you're on your phone but we're not talking it's very simple yeah, yeah. it's like oh good for you so, so i said did, did you ever do you say these things more often it's like no never in my life <laughs> say something like that it's like well, that might be linked to it. So it's also certain inhibitions that you have, uh, maybe setting your boundaries that come more naturally. Um, and it, it also also interesting stuff like connections with, with lovers, uh, tantric abilities. Some things open up, the system gets cleaned in a way for our innate abilities to connect and and connect with ourselves and others to uh, to flow more uh, more beautifully yeah it's a, it's a really beautiful practice and i i mentioned to you i've had a couple of experience with it um so i did it like three times previously back in from like 2020 to 2021 ish um and the first time first two times i did it like uh, the first minute i saw like like you said like the moment you see the instruction going on like somebody demonstrates you're like okay who did she pay to come here yeah, right. and do this yeah. and then after i experienced it the first day i was like okay this is pretty cool i felt like a little bit of movement in my body i just felt like a t- total emptiness in my body i kind of left my body and you know just felt like very very like a thin piece of paper and just this this nothingness which is really beautiful second time i did it, i started feeling like oh my goodness this all this energy is moving through my body all different parts of my body were moving my uh, kundalini was rising so like as i was on the ground my spine went up so i was like kept coming up um it was a lot of like ab work it felt like but actually i wasn't sore the next day um and then ever since then like my kundalini flow is, is open so when i do breath work when i did the session with you i mean immediately i could get into it if i'm just thinking about it like i can get into that to that flow of you know, having these energy centers open up and it helps my meditation practice. And it, it really is a, is a, a bill, like a vessel that cleans the inside of your system. That's able to allow this, this subtle energy to, to move through it. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. And, and so the only thing that's required is trust that your system knows this, yeah. this innate intelligence that knows what's the, what to do. Um, and and when the thought comes, like you said, okay, first you had a, a little bit of movement. It probably was accompanied by a thought like, "Am I making this up, or mm-hmm. am I actually doing?" Okay, I just let it go, and then uh, what uh, what is needed will come up. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that's important. Like, let your mind go there, right? So then it could like you know process of elimination. Okay, let it go there. Let it be you know skeptical of it then, okay, maybe this is not, you know, so kind of moving through the, the motion to like then full trust and like, wow, no matter what my mind went through, like I feel so much better and I feel so much clearer. My mind is clearer. My heart is open, these kinds of things. And then, you know, the, the medicine that you gave us, like on the, on the, on the cruise, we were like literally on the Nile river on a private like <laughs> boat and you were facilitating for, it's gotta be like 50 people and uh, just the combined energy and I don't even know it because my eyes were closed, obviously, but my Kundalini was active the whole time. And at the very end, when we just like relaxed, I didn't even know where time was. I didn't even know I had a body. I actually remember coming to my mind and thinking, oh my goodness, am I still alive or am I not here anymore? Do I even have a body? Where where am I? Am I in my bed? Or like, yeah, these are the things, these are some of the thoughts that happen to me when I'm in a really, really deep meditation. So um, such a powerful experience with, with you. And, you know, I thank you. This was not planned at all. You just, uh, you just decided that, you know, th- uh, there was a couple of requests after the talk you gave and you said, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to do it. And, uh, it's just beautiful. Those are the kinds of moments where it's just like, nothing is scripted, nothing is planned and, and boom, you, you make this magic happen. It was, it was really nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like, and similarly, like you doing these kind of podcasts. So you have just a few outlines. Like, okay, maybe these these topics we want to discuss, but you let it go and and it flows. And and this is how 
the most beautiful things in life happen when you try to control it. Like I, I went into public speaking first and I scripted out every word and it's like, Oh, well, it sounds really great if you have everything timed out and everything works well, but if you screw up a little bit, then everything goes down the drain and it's so much easier to let go of any expectations and allow life to flow through you. And then, well, yeah. Beautiful things like this arise. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a big part of my life is coming to that realization that, yeah, you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to script everything out. Like, first of all, what is it? Like, uh, we make plans and God laughs. That's like the quote, right? <laughs> it's like, we try to control every aspect rather than just being there. And when you're being there, you're actually feeling the, the, the moment when you're in your head, it's like your, your head is here. And then you're like all the way down in another area where mm -hmm. you're seeing this unfold, but it's like, there's a very deep, um, or a very distance connection there. So like, I really feel like for me to fully embrace loving doing this podcast and really getting the best conversations and the most, you know, juice out of everything it's yet yeah, to fully like embrace the moment and not try to try to plan everything out or try to like, think about like what I want to say while somebody's talking. It's just like, yeah, just, just go and it'll all flow. And if I ever fuck up, I could always edit it. Right? So it's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. So, so well, when you're in, in, in a flow state like that, then people know that you and life in those instances are not two. So if you have a great basketball player and he's doing his thing during the movement, he's not there. But then once he scores, he's like, yeah, I did that. Um, and similarly, whenever you, you allow it to flow without the concept of the story of me, uh, there's no separation. And that's what we long for because it's our essence we know deep down that there is no separation that's it's just seeming um and that's why we long for love that's why we long for beauty and wisdom because the object and the subject merge and there's just simply the beauty and the perfection of this moment yeah absolutely and I would love to, you know, as learning about your life unfold, can you tell us a little bit about the pranic uh, living that you do? Yeah, yeah. So it's still not completely transitioned, but at like, say, maybe 80%. So it was a year and a half ago that I saw, <laughs> I have this amazing thing where <clears throat> things just come on on my path, like the same thing with the trip to, to Egypt. It's like, uh, I saw a YouTube video of this guy talking about living of prana. So you have sun gazers, which are people, yogis who substitutes eating, um, by looking at the sun and they get their energy from that process. Then you have breatharians. So people that do breath work and this, uh, at the same time, this is, exchanging food for breathing. But then I heard that there's also this thing called pranic living where you don't even ex have to exchange it for anything else. It just, just comes from the ether into your cells. And I heard this guy talking about it and he said, well, it's quite simple actually, because the, the first cells and I'm not a medic, so I, I wouldn't know exactly. I'm not a doctor, but like, uh, at the moment of conception, you know, the, the, when the fetus is growing, it doesn't have a digestion system yet. So it's able to get energy into the cells and grow, uh, from the outside. And, uh, this guy talked about it and it was really funny. It's like, I've heard this voice a few times before this, this voice comes up, like similarly the voice that I said that starts laughing when the mind comes up with a, a plan of what it desires. I have this, I had this at the same time when I was listening to this guy who said, yeah, yeah. so the longest period I haven't eaten and uh, had anything to drink was five and a half months. And it, it sounds incredulous, of course, but deep from inside, this voice said really in a, in a simple way like this, yeah, yeah, I can do that too. And then my mind came, I was like, uh, no, 
you eat a lot and you drink like tons of water. <laughs> <laughs> but I know when I hear that voice, it's like, yeah, you might want to listen. So I contact this guy and this guy literally lives 15 kilometers away from me in the Netherlands. So uh, he said, uh, we should do a, a Zoom call. We called and he said, okay, I can uh, start to transition with you for one week. We uh, we spent together three days, no eating, no drinking. And uh, then we go into juices. And uh, um, so the cells are reprogrammed to once they uh, regenerate, to go to their non-programmed cell, which is able to live off prana. Um, and nowadays, I usually don't eat during the week. Monday to Friday, I don't eat. I still drink water. I, I feel I need to separate that. I still notice that that's going to be like a, I drink a lot less than before, but it's two different paths. Uh, but I don't eat from Monday to Friday usually. And then in a the weekend, I eat something. Sometimes I feel longer periods of eating like four or five days and then maybe two weeks not eating. So when we went to Egypt, I felt like, yeah, before I go into the king's chamber, I want to be completely clean, at least one week of not eating. Uh, and then after the king's chamber, I didn't eat for, I think, three days. And then at breakfast, there was this, this, I, I love sitting with you guys at breakfast, but I'm just not eating. It's just fine. It's just nice having conversation and seeing everyone enjoy the food. Yeah, food was good. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But I was starting to smell the, the strawberries like, oh, those are really good strawberries. So I wanted to try it. And then uh, day 10, I was like, okay, I'm going to start with strawberry. Um, and then you, you start up the system again. So which actually costs a lot of energy because it's been down for a week and a half. Um, and as a result of it, I started to lose weight of eating that one strawberry because the system started up again. Uh, so then I have to eat a little bit to regain my weight. So for me, I still lose a little bit of weight. So that's why every once in a while I start eating again. Uh, but it's, I feel it's just a matter of time and I don't want to rush it. So I feel that there's this free fall process in all of these things. I, I heard someone, uh, someone asked me like, why would you want to live off prana? You know? And the idea came up that it's similar to a love relationship. If you're in a relationship and you need the other, it's doomed. It's, it's going to fail, you know? And then you might grow up and evolve and do a lot of work on yourself. And you are able to stand on your own two feet and be okay with the, the things we feel are missing in our life. And if both, of you have done this, you can have a very beautiful relationship, but it's often in between those two that you feel I need to be able to stand on my own feet. So there's first uh, a dependent relationship. Then it's like, no, I don't want any relationship. And then there's a beautiful relationship, which in which love can flourish and the, the love for being with each other just expresses itself beautifully. Similarly with food, we have an addiction to food. We need it. But it's not a beautiful relationship. It's like that needy, clingy love relationship. So I want to go out and be able to live without. And then it's not food negation. It's food freedom to eat whenever the desire comes to, to experience this part of life, but not be dependent on it. And um, yeah, being able to live of prana, it gives so much you it's like you're in a deep meditation the entire time you're so much more connected to everything um and once you start eating you become very aware of what type of foods have what kind of effects and that there's like this you could almost say like a veil that comes in front of the eyes the moment you start eating just everything comes a bit more blurry a little bit more distant a little bit more yeah. yeah. So, so interesting. It's um, having that coherent and conscious choice to be able to decide what you want to do rather than requiring it. Right. We always think, oh, three meals a day. Right. But also, you know, like just my little kindergarten version of this is I decided to give up sugar this year. And uh, starting January, I just made the the willpower decision. Yeah. Maybe like 
the first two days I was like, okay, dessert would be nice or a little bit of like, you know, coffee with chocolate or whatever, which I usually do. But after that, I just kind of gave it up and like, it was super easy once I made the decision. And then, you know, when we went to uh, Egypt, I was like, you know what, I'm in Egypt once and I would love to experience it. Not that I need the sugar. I didn't have any desire to have, but I was like, okay, I want to have this experience of enjoying the the dessert. And, um, you know, I had it a, a couple of days and it was fine. And then once I got back, I stopped again and like, yeah, a couple of days took a little bit of effort to like willpower or whatever. And then boom, I'm, I'm done. Like, so it's been a, three weeks now that I haven't had uh, any kind of sugar and I feel great. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's not all or nothing. We can dance through life and, and make the decisions, but having the empowerment to make those decisions is the, is the whole game, right? Deciding from a place of power rather than a place of I need. And just like you said, Definitely. with relationships, same thing. I talk to my girlfriend about this all the time is like, you know, we've, we, you and I have been through so much. We know what we wanted in a partner. We found it, but it's not like, if, if this doesn't work out, it's not like a, where our lives are going to be destroyed. We're very strong, independent people on our own. We don't need each other, but we're happy to choose each other every single day. And that's really, again, it's a place of being in empowerment and not having that need. To, oh my goodness, this person is going to complete my life. And, you know, I talk to so many people on a daily basis. I have a wellness center here in Jersey City. And the amount of people that come in, oh, I'm heartbroken. You know, my my girlfriend left me or my boyfriend left me. It's like, you know, this uh, the the step of kind of understanding that you are the relationship, you're your ultimate relationship that you need to be in love with, and everything else kind of doesn't matter as long as you have yourself. That's really the the most important thing. And then, yeah, stepping into something with empowerment is 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 the best way to do it. Because yeah, these these attachments, we're going to still continue to attract the same types of people if we are coming from that place of neediness. Because the universe wants to teach us the lesson. You chose to to have this lesson when you signed up to come here, and it's going to keep repeating until we kind of move through it. Yeah, definitely. So when you um, what you touched upon is is that in order for a beautiful relationship to flourish your relationship with yourself is sets the bar so you are only able to connect with another up to the level that you're able to connect with yourself so if you want to really feel and understand your other um you really need to dive into it into your own feelings and and so your relationship with yourself is is crucial and it almost sounds it sounds a bit harsh but if you see the word love is often misunderstood because it's it's often in duality opposed to hate or judgment but if you truly love your girlfriend and she would say, I think I would be happier with someone else, of course it would hurt. But if you truly loved her, you would say, then that is the choice you have to make. It's going to hurt, but you being happy is the most important thing. I being happy is the most important thing. You should do what makes you the most happy. I should do what makes me the most happy. Um, and if it can switch like that to hate, then it was probably tainted a lot with your own traumas. Uh, often we find ourselves in relationships with that has some linkage to our parents, our upbringing. I think uh, you were also there. We had a, a talk about relationships another day, right? When, Possibly, yeah. Which yeah, so 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 specifically it was in a group session. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were talking, just the guys talking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so for me, um, well, it was very clear already from, uh, I think it was 20 or something, 
you, you said uh, uh, something during this talk about that there's one common element, common demeanor, and it's you. And I had like a, a series of very short relationships of only a few months. And I could find like, yeah, this one doesn't like this. Not, uh, so that's why it didn't work. And a good friend of mine said like, do you find a common denominator? And it's like, <laughs> well, this girl that's like, no, no, no. The common denominator is like, all right, me? Like, yeah, yeah. And then I started to dig and dive in and I realized like, well, my parents, they stayed together for the children, but they weren't happy. And I would fall time and time again for the same type of woman, which I even coined like a, a term, like pretty face, sad eyes. <laughs> you told us about this. Yes. Can you go so, into this? I mean, <laughs> beautiful women, but there's like spark in her eyes. Like, yeah. And then, then the, the hero would come up like, well, I can save you, darling. You know? <laughs> Recipe for disaster. Um, so it was interesting to see how that, even though I was aware of it, it kept on coming up. And it was five years ago, I think I don't dance salsa or were, were two lessons where I had to, uh, there's always shortage of men. So sometimes the school would call me up, can you uh, participate in this lesson? And at the end of the first lesson, I saw my ex-girlfriend walking in and I saw in the corner of my eyes and the far came, really, are we going to go through this game again? Have we learned our lesson? Because she was typical, beautiful, but just this twinkle in her eyes, like, oh, sad. And it was so interesting because she was very aware of her patterns also. And literally the first day we were together, I said, I like you because of this pain I have with my mom and my dad. And she said, oh, I like you because of this pain I have with my stepdad. And it was two years of going away, coming together, going away until we both could process it. And, and this is how, how beautiful relationships can be to let go of our traumas. Um, and it's so interesting to see ever since I've, I've sometimes seen those type of women that before would trigger me. It's like, oh, and it just, it's not there anymore. Um, so relationships can be such a beautiful accelerator for seeing what our undealt traumas and, and issues are. Yeah, the 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 ultimate growth, the ultimate mirror for for ourselves and and what is like holding us back in life. And you know, my girlfriend and I talk about it all the time. Uh we are our big, biggest mirrors. And yeah, really stepping into that and taking self-responsibility for how we think about or how we thought about the past relationships, what we learned from it, what we take into it and how we become the best version of ourselves for ourselves and then for the other person. And then, yeah, if you're coming into a place where, you know, this, this torsion field is, is love and positivity and you're meeting somebody in that same torsion field and you come together, it creates a, a really beautiful, you know, magical life together. But then, yeah, it's like for, for me, I would rather be on my own creating that than being in a relationship that doesn't have that kind of beautiful uh, symmetry and, and, you know, cohesiveness and coherence, you know, and similar vision, mm -hmm. similar path. But yeah, really it's, it's all about, and this took me a while is to, to figure out how to love myself and, you know, still, still on that path, but really that is the, the biggest game changer in anyone's life is the moment they realize that they are divinity and treating themselves as such. And um, yeah, yeah, that's where, that's, that's where all the growth happens. And then, then it becomes a game. It, it becomes like a, a game of how, what do you want to experience? Yeah. Beautiful. Glad to hear that. Uh, that has done uh, because for most people it's abracadabra. You're like, Rick, what are you talking about? You know, I need the car. I need the girlfriend. Then I'll be happy. Like, yeah. <laughs> try it. <laughs> yeah, but it's sure important. It, yeah, it's important for them to go after it and, and get there and oh, yeah, then realize, definitely. right? Yeah. It's like that everything just unfolds onto the next onto the next path. That that conversation that all of us had, it was just like uh, about like 10 guys. We were just talking about the challenges guys go through and some of the things we're all working through. And uh, it was really, really beautiful conversation. I, uh, uh, I would love to have a part two to that one day. We could do it on Zoom with uh, with all the guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was also beautiful because it, the, the entire group was from people all, all over the world, you know? So 
connecting in this way and um, seeing that's universal, which of course we know, but it's nice to experience in such a way. Yeah. And at the end of the day, humanity, we're all going through very similar things. Doesn't matter what upbringing, what, what you've gone through in life, if you're super successful, if you're not so successful financially, it didn't matter in that moment. Like everybody there was there for each other. And that's what like family and community is all about. It's, it's, it's every type of experience you can have all put together. And then you see the beauty in each person because they remind you of an aspect of yourself. And that was like a, a microcosm of the entire group where, you know, somebody was telling me, telling us a story. Like, um, I forget who it was, but, uh, I think it was, was it Peter or, um, he was saying that, uh, that he went through an ayahuasca experience and he had this download that every girlfriend that he had, like that he hurt or he, he did something bad to, or they did something bad to, he kind of healed that in the moment. And he, he apologized and he forgave the people that hurt him. He made amends spiritually with the people that, you know, he did bad things too. And then he started reaching out to them after the ceremony. And he's like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm sorry if I hurt you or I forgive you. And then that mm -hmm. made such a big difference. That is, that is the exact thing that happened to me when I was, after my first ayahuasca experience, I literally spent the next six months reaching out to all the different girlfriends, all the family members, all the people that I, that I heard, I was able to see it from their, their experience, the situations, whatever happens. And I just wanted to make amends. And once you start clearing all the, the, the feeling of negativity towards someone else, then your life just starts really elevating because you're done with that. Otherwise we're just carrying that forward. So, um, that's just one example, but all the conversations I had, every story like matched something in my life that, that was very important for me to go through. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's beautiful the way that everybody came together on this, on this trip. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> So Marnix, tell me, why do you think you came here to planet Earth as Marnix and what did you want to experience? Uh, yeah, that's funny. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't believe in conventional way of reincarnation, uh, although I did do regression therapy with a good friend of mine for three and a half days straight, pretty intense uh experienced like almost firsthand it felt like you're so in that life really tremendous and terrible ways of dying um but at the same time it was clear that as i don't f feel myself to be this body um, and it sounds strange because it, you're, you're living two things at the same time. Yes, I'm living through this person called Marnix, uh, a guy from the Netherlands, a uh, photographer, uh, whatever he does. But at the same time, it's clear that anything which is, is me. If it's known, it's me. So the screen you sitting uh, in New Jersey, um, the camera, cars outside, anything which is, is me. So it feels like that perspective of a center has fallen away during this lifetime. However, when you say like, what is your purpose? Why did you come here? It feels because I have a remembrance of something which happened before I was born. And I remember coming back to it a few times in my youth. And the, what happened there was that I was asked the question, and I think it was written on a paper, piece of paper, really difficult questions. Like if you had to choose to only have one arm or one parent, what would you choose? And these questions were like such a heavy interrogation that all I ended up screaming out was, I'm not old enough to answer these questions. And then the voice says, at the end of this life, what is it you want? And I said, the only thing I want is wisdom. The only thing I want is wisdom. 
and um, that seems to be quite in line with how this life has unfolded. There's a strong longing for wisdom of who, what this is. So I think that kind of answers the question of <laughs> what is it I came to do here? That's... If you want to speak in these terms of I, but yeah. Thank you. And what do you believe God to be? And what does spirituality like role does it play in your life? God is this. I love the beautiful saying of I searched for God, found only myself. Search for myself, found only God. There's just this arising out of complete emptiness, out of complete potential, a form to play a divine comedy. And it is our concept of good and bad, the and the eight of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that keeps us lost in this game that says, oh no, this moment, not good. I need that. Um, God is both the, the good and the evil. And that is true love. So when we talk about unconditional love, people don't like the unconditional part. They like the love part. <laughs> but the unconditional part means that the guy who screams at you or if you want to go more extreme, uh, a dictator, it's also unconditional love. And it is because we need those experiences in order to taste the sweetness of life. We need the bitter. And so when I walk on the streets and I see a, a homeless person or a beggar, or I see someone who's totally lost in their story, they are all adding to this experience because it's one collective of experience that allows for any of us to fully embrace this moment. It's, if you really dive fully into this moment, you let go of the story, you really dive fully into what you're experiencing now, the sensations of your chair on your butts, your, 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 the smell of, of whatever is in the room, the air that you breathe in and out. There is such a richness. There's such a beauty. That is what God is. There's this full immersiveness of life. And I have so many times that I just start laughing hysterically because if you dive into life completely, how beautiful is it to be able to experience this as if you're a separate person inside a world on a spinning planet, going around other planets, uh, around the sun and, and, uh, and this the entire, who comes up with this shit? It's fucking amazing. <laughs> this is God. This is the, 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 that what we with our pity little minds can't conceive of, but we don't need to because this very existence, this very experience is the beauty of God. And it's not different from you or me or anything that is known. Yeah. Like I said, the, the subject, the verb and the object, they're all one. They're all the same essence, knowing consciousness, which is God. So beautiful. We'll have to do a, a part two and talk about yeah. non-duality. <laughs> I'm sure we can yeah, go into yeah. that subject quite a bit. But Marnix, I wanted to thank you so much, brother. That was uh, yeah. so heartwarming, so soul-touching. And uh, yeah, just to be able to connect with you and be your friend is... Uh, it's, it's a real blessing in my life. And um, how can we learn more about you? Um, is there a website that we can go to if anybody wants to, to get coaching or do Kundalini activation with you? Sure, yeah. No, first of all, uh, 
it's completely mutual. Uh, thanks for uh, showing up on the trip and uh, meeting uh, each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, my 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 company is called Unconditional Attention. Uh, so uh, just strung together dot com. Uh, I give uh, non duality teachings uh, also online on uh, Instagram and YouTube. Um, and also one-on-one -on -one. and the Kundalini, I do them in person, um, some mostly in the Netherlands, but also abroad every once in a while. Uh, and I do them online. So it can be in a group session, uh, a few weeks ago, I think two weeks ago I did with Sri and uh, a few, uh, people in Los Angeles or at different locations. Uh, it works well. Sometimes it's just one-on-one. -on -one. It's beautiful to see how these things, uh, are independent of uh, of distance and I know uh, it's of course nor normal because energy doesn't have a boundary. But to experience it, it's, it's beautiful to see how this uh, can help people live a more lighter life and uh, without the story, the heavy story of self. It's so powerful. And what a freaking time to be alive, by the way. We're like five, oh, 6,000 yes. miles away from each other. I'm seeing you crystal clear. We're having this amazing conversation. You know, if we were born a couple thousand years earlier, or even a couple hundred years, not possible. Um, but yeah, it's, it's this life is so beautiful. And uh, yeah, I look forward to connecting for uh, for part two, for sure. And um, to, to stay in touch. And I hope everybody check out his YouTube channel. He's got some really beautiful shorts and also longer videos where he goes deeper into a lot of these subjects. So thank you so much. Thank you, my man.